So, hello, welcome. Uh, I'm Daniel Simpson and I'm joined today by uh, Laura von Ostrovsky, who's going to be talking to me generally about yoga philosophy, but um, also specifically about her new book, which is uh, her PhD, uh, you know, several years of deep research looking at yoga philosophy you know, more generally, but very specifically looking at the Yoga Sutra, the text that everybody wants to talk about. <laughs> and uh, you've titled the, the, the book uh, Ein Text in Bewegung, so a text in motion, um, and the motion really seems to be an interpretation. <laughs> it's a text that says some things quite clearly that aren't necessarily the focus of people today looking at it. Instead, they have their other ideas about what they would like it to say. So I wondered if you could first just uh, give us a little general introduction, you know, what is the traditional function of the Yoga Sutra? What does it actually tell us if we read it on its own terms? And how is that different to the way that people want to use it today? Thanks, Daniel, and thanks for um, the invitation to this chat. I really look forward to that. And um, yeah, I mean, I called it uh, text in Bewe a text in Bewegung, a text in motion, because I did my master thesis on the reception of the Yoga Sutra in uh, Germany in the early 20th century and um, just focused on Sanskrit terms and how they changed uh, from first um, tr uh, um, translations, uh, Deussen and so on, like um, late 19th century to then up to the um, 1930s in Germany, so to um, National Socialism. And um, I realized that the text, even in that time, when it was not connected to physical practice as it is today, it changed its meanings um, completely, <laughs> depending on if there was a psychologist reading the text, a national socialist or a philosopher or an academic like Paul Deussen. So, um, and that means this text has in its reception history, but um, also before in India, has always been in motion. So um, it is not a static text that has had one meaning in the last 2000 years. And um, now today, of course, um, and this is kind of a, is, it has a double meaning, the um, a book title. Now, today, of course, it is related to physical practice. So motion becomes then, um, <laughs> um, or gets another dimension. So, um, yeah, of course, when we look at the um, Patanjali Yoga Shastra, that means the Yoga Sutra in connection with um, it's Bhashya, um, then this is a text Just that Just to it's, clarify for anyone it, listening who doesn't know Sanskrit, Bhashya means commentary, yeah? So there's a commentary that yes, goes right. with the sutras, like almost extended footnotes explaining them. That's it. And we have this theory of um, the Indologist Philip Maas, who claims, and um, this is very accepted by now in uh, yoga studies and academic yoga research, that um, the Yoga Sutra has always been somehow connected to the Bhashya, to um, this oldest commentary from the beginning on. So um, one could even say, this is a theory, of course, or a thesis that um, the Bhashya was written by the same author than the Sutra, but we just don't know, of course, but um, it has, it had and has um, still an extreme um, authority in its history. So if we look at um, the sutra, this very short like notes, let's say, um, without nearly a verb in it, <laughs> and <laughs> a very extended big bhashya, then of course, this is a text that um, in the end teaches disembodiment. So it uh, wants to remove, um, let's say, the practitioner from daily life, from embodied life, from social life, from, um, yeah, it's actually a renunciative text for um, an ascetic elite and a male ascetic, ascetic elite. elite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for a male ascetic elite, as Philip Maas also worked out in one of his articles. And um, so, yeah, there, there is a very different, um, let's say, goal. <laughs> Um, that this text aims at then what um, the text is used for today. So just, I mean, one could go into many details here, but um, maybe we just can dive into this when it fits. But when we look at today's reception, um, 
it is broad and I have to say that in my book I focused on a certain um, like part of the yoga scene, Ashtanga yoga, as it was um, shaped by South Indian Patabi Joyce, but um, somehow prepared and um, built up by uh, Tirumalai Krishnamacharya in the 1930s um, in um, South India too. And um, so I really looked only at this um, part of yoga history, and there is a much broader part of Indian yoga history in the 20th century, so we have to be clear about that. But um, when I looked at um, Ashtanga yoga, a little bit at the history of Ashtanga yoga, um, um, according to Patak Joyce, but then especially here in Germany, um, this differs, let's say, extensively from an old let's say really old indian and uh, in connection with the commentary view on um, uh, the yoga sutra so yeah should i go into details how it well, differs yeah i think one thing that stands out when you say motion and just in case anybody isn't too familiar with ashtanga yoga it's it's flowing sequences of postures connected together so moving from one thing to another repeatedly for 90 minutes so it's the basis of what people today perhaps know as vinyasa yoga um, so it's, it's, it's the exact opposite of what Patanjali in the Yoga Sutra is saying, which is basically sit down, shut up, don't do anything ever again and learn that you're not the body. And in fact, you're not this world. <laughs> so, um, uh, it's, it, it seems that you know, physical practice in the Yoga Sutra, as you say, is to disconnect from the body and perhaps even become disembodied. So if we could maybe even start there, where, where can we see clear evidence of those two things, you know, disconnection from the body and even about disembodiment for anybody who's doubting that this is what the Yoga Sutra actually says. In the text itself, you mean? Hmm. Well, first of all, it, it does not um, evolve any notion of the body. That's the first thing. So it does not talk about it. It just talks about it in negation. For example, that the body um, is um, I just have German words in my head, but it's um, disgusting. It should be there should be a reluctance from the body. So this is one thing because it just distracts. It distracts um, from a let's say um, singular um, meditative mental state. Yeah. This is so, Sutra two forty. In case anybody's wondering, I think isn't it where they talk about? Yeah, the it must be Sutra two forty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a Sutra of. 39 or 40 yeah a sutra that is was actually in the teacher training that i did my research on and i write on that too it was um left out so it was <laughs> not talked about <laughs> um yeah so i think this is very common in in modern yoga to leave these um traces in the sutra that somehow really Rare, it rarely happens um, explicitly, but when it happens that the body is somehow um, disregarded, um, that there is an evidence for a disregard of um, the body, they are left out. So these are not the prominent sutras <laughs> at all. And they've never been actually, they've also not been prominent in the early 20th century, even if they, this was quite a disembodied view on the Yoga Sutra at that time. So yeah, this is the first thing. And then we, we only see in the whole text that it um, somehow deals with mental states. So it deals yes. with different mental, um, extremely focused, concentrated states. And um, now the thing is, if we, what I try to do in my, in my work, if we um, understand the whole, let's say human cosmos not in a dualistic view so there's body and mind and they don't interact but they somehow interact in not only somehow but they interact every minute every second of our lives um if we just say a purely purely mental states or purely um yeah concentrative states or something like that as long as you live 
this is an, still an embodied state. I think this is what we have to somehow still acknowledge and still have to look at. And I, I miss this sometimes in the discussion. So um, there is this view on total disembodiment in the Yoga Sutra or the uh, Patanjali Yoga Shastra and today a uh, whole focus on embodiment and that means moving. But even if you don't move and you meditate um, on your cushion and you sit there very still and you try to um, get let's say more and more still in your body it's still your body <laughs> it's still there <laughs> well, actually there's a quite a nice contrast in in one of the other traditional texts that yoga teacher trainings often focus on that again doesn't get that much attention there at the start of chapter three of the bhagavad gita um they basically make fun of these ascetic yogis saying it's impossible to not do anything your, your body's as long as you're alive your body's doing things whether you want it to or not so the question is you know what do you do with this activity and how's your relationship with activity but people then i think in the modern world seem to want to read the yoga sutra as if it's talking about the same thing rather than is the exact opposite the very thing that the gita was rejecting yeah completely yeah so um i think it's something we should look at if we if we look at these or if we claim that the that the patanjali yoga shastra is searching for totally disembodied states i mean if you look at just the the dualism it states of purusha and prakriti um just when the connection with prakriti only ends when death is there so it only ends when actually the body does not move anymore because it's <laughs> <laughs> Which is what Sankhya philosophy says. If you go to the Sankhya Karika, I mean, I think it's 68, uh, the Karika that says that you know, Kaivalya is you know, total disconnection from the body, as in, you know, exactly that, no longer being embodied because you're no longer alive. Um, That's it. And of course, nobody's going to do that while they're alive. So people in the modern world sometimes say, well, when academics are saying all this, they're just picking the text to pieces, they're failing to see all the wonderful ideas in it, and we shouldn't even listen to them. And uh, I think, you know, there's sometimes a danger that people can mistake this uh, attempt to show what the text says for trying to say nobody should ever look at it. Nobody's allowed to be inspired by it. You should put it away unless you want to sit in a cave for the rest of your life. Um, and I just want to make clear that's not what we're trying to do here. We're, we're, we're trying to actually just see actually what the Yoga Sutra teaches, the ability to distinguish one thing from another thing. Um, that's yes. the practice of discernment, which is what leads to this separation. Um, yes. But at the very simple level, we're just trying to separate what it says itself from what other people have made it mean. And there's one other point that I'd like to just quickly come back to. You mentioned, obviously, your focus on Ashtanga yoga. And that word, I think, Ashtanga is a very interesting one because that's the part of the text that everybody's so excited by today. You know, if you ask anybody about yoga philosophy, they'll start talking about eight limbs and uh, that's the literal meaning of Ashtanga. But I wonder if you could just perhaps talk a little bit about the two different uses of that term to mean you know, eight limbs in the modern yoga world and, and also that particular practice, just to help people understand the difference. Yeah, so um, for Pashtabi Joyce Ashtanga Yoga, it is a bit difficult to find out why this practice was called Ashtanga Yoga and when, when this is such a direct um, 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 reflection on the second part of the second chapter of the Yoga Sutra or this part of the second um, chapter. And um, I mean, we have a um, some informations from Mark Singleton and I did not find out much more historically on how and why Patabi Joy started to call it Ashtanga Yoga. Um, but it seems that's what uh, Mark Singleton found out in um, in uh, chats with um, students of Patavi Joyce um, that it was called asana before in the 1970s. So his physical intense yoga um, system of um, dynamic movements was called asana in the um 19 or well, before in the 1970s the first americans came to um, mysore to learn from patabi joyce and they wanted to know what is this how is this called <laughs> um what we what we do here on the mat and um so um there is uh, 
like from my own historical research, when I looked at what Patabi Joyce actually wanted to, um, or, or how his own understanding of the Yoga Sutra was, it was not an embodied text for him. It was not a text that taught exactly um, the practice he was teaching. There was not what he was um, writing in his book Yoga Mala. And it was. No, he's talking about Hatha Yoga texts there, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he introduces or he includes the Yoga Sutra in some points, especially the notion of tapas that the Yoga Sutra, of course, also um, employs in the Ashtanga section and um, some other things. But mainly he talks actually about Hatha Yoga and um, he uses tetric terms, too. So he has, um, yeah, this book has a um, not a, a, let's say, very intimate connection to the to the Yoga Sutra. And um, yeah, so when I talked to some senior students, I interviewed some senior students of Patabi Joyce, for example, Gregor Mela, and he told me like, he knew the Yoga Sutra before. He did a philosophy uh, training in Berlin and he knew the text and he wanted to go to India to find someone who teaches him how to do it, <laughs> how to experience it. So the theory is a little bit that um, um, this system, which was is basically a asana, um, an intense asana practice um, was like more and more shaped uh, to be called Ashtanga Yoga by, let's say, an exchange between Westerners asking and Padavi Joyce reacting and responding to it. Yeah. So we have this and this makes it very like somehow the discourse difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. What What is meant by Ashtanga and then also what's meant by Asana, because Asana is one of the eight parts. Ashtanga is just eight parts, the limbs, really components, yeah. uh, elements of a system. Um, but if the main focus is on the postures, which is what Asana comes to mean, and we go back to the Yoga Sutra, it just doesn't really have anything to say. It doesn't name any postures in the Sutra part. And even in the commentary, it just talks about how to sit. So it's not got anything to do, as you say, with this embodied practice. So why the attempt, do you think, to focus on this text so closely? Why is everybody so interested in it? <laughs> well, first of all, um... It just started in the late 19th century with with the Theosophists. The Theosophists were extremely uh, influential um, in not only in their own realm of listeners, which was already brought, um, but um, like Theosophists themselves, <laughs> um, <laughs> but they um, attracted um, scientists um, of different sorts, psychologists, um, but also writers and artists. So they had an extreme influence and they had a deep interest in their text already. And um, so it started early in um, Britain, in America, in Germany especially. And it seems to me it, it just went on and on. <laughs> so the interest of that te to, um, it, it, it's somehow an, a, a magic text. It, 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 it never faded. It, um, it just changed shape. <laughs> so the interest, how um, the text was uh, interpreted and for what it was used, for example, Jakob Wilhelm Hauer in the 1930s really used it um, to um, rationalize um, uh, killing billions of Jews. So he, uh, it, that, that was a, the rationalization of why to use that text um, was, very manifold and broad. So I think it Could is... you try to summarize that for people? Because obviously that's quite a shocking thing to hear that, uh, that yeah. uh, the yoga I mean, Bible was 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 given that. Yeah, role. I know. <laughs> well, actually, Jakob Wilhelm Hauer moved away from the Yoga Sutra towards the Bhagavad Gita. That's um, obviously a clearer justification of <laughs> kill people and you won't be stained by it. <laughs> that's exactly what his um, like attempt was. So the attempt of just acting in the world because this is your dharma, whatever, and um afterwards not kind of standing next to it and not being don't have any um should don't have any um guilt guilt <laughs> that's it so actually he moved away from the yoga sutra but um at that point he already um published quite some books so he had an a uh let's say intense um yeah 
he he was very influential on how the yoga sutra was perceived afterwards even when i was in university we read his translation it is one of the German translations that is still common <laughs> so um and he yeah he used the text uh, still to have this disengagement from the world so actually it's about purusha it is not about that was his way to put it it's not about prakriti and what is happening in the world you can be detached by it by focusing on what is the real let's say um what is the real um internal self inside of you which is called Purusha by the Yoga Sutra. So that was kind of his way to put it. Um, it, it cannot be it, it cannot be reasoned upon if you think it further <laughs> with the Yoga Sutra. But yeah, so that is part. Of, so basically, a, you get in touch with your true self, and you can do what you like. It doesn't matter because you're just anchored in that. Um, similarly, in some ways, that's that's how people in more recent decades in the West, uh, you know, particularly in the United States, I think, and Canada, had uh, particularly thinking of Ian Witcher and Chris Chappell, have been talking about you know the real meaning of the text is like the Gita, detachment in action rather than total detachment. <laughs> Yes, that's exactly it. This detachment in action, and that's how. I mean, actually, at that point um, in 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 history in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, they had a, a much. I mean, there was a big exchange with indologists. So, and Lacker Willemar was an indologist himself, so he he knew after I don't know after a while he just knew that the text doesn't say that <laughs> there is no detachment in action. So he turned towards the Bhagavad Gita. Um, yeah. Well, there is one little bit that sort of hints at it, isn't there? Talking about Kriya Yoga at the very yes. start of the second chapter, it's almost borrowing the language of the Bhagavad Gita to describe, you know, the, the nature of doing things without attachment. But it's more about that's the preliminary. That's that's what you do when you can't focus your mind, is what the Bhashya says. So yes. uh, when you when you can focus and you stop doing things and turn inwards. Yeah, um, there's a similarity to karma. Karma yoga, yeah. Yeah, in that sense, is yeah. So there's there's, there's there's so many ways though that I think uh, one other person you focused on in your book have, have really changed the what we do today in relation to this text, uh, and that was Vivekananda, and obviously he's you know had a big influence. <laughs> People you know referred to his work, and uh, he himself was referring to other you know, foreign translations. I think when he wrote about the Yoga Sutra, but what he did was to detach it from the commentary. And then basically give himself permission to say anything he liked, which is yes. what people now do. Yeah, Vivekananda, I mean, um, he was very close to Paul Deussen. So um, there is evidence that Vivekananda was also inspired by Paul Deussen's Upanishadic, very monistic um, rendering of the Yoga Sutra, which has um, history in the Indian um, which there is a continuity in the Indian history to um, read the Yoga Sutra as a monistic text. Yeah, so this Just is to clarify, not... monistic for anyone who doesn't know the idea of everything is everything is one uh, rather than that there are two things that should always be understood to be separate. Yes, so he uses the term Atman, for example, which is used in the Upanishads and in the Bhagavad Gita and not the term um, Purusha, Vivekananda doesn't use it and Paul Deussen doesn't use it too. So um, they had big exchange, um, they met each other and so on. So there might have or there was already an intercultural exchange on the Yoga Sutra in, in that time. And yeah, what Vivekananda actually did and what I think was maybe not content wise, but on a systematic um, level that he detached the sutra completely from the Bhashya and um, made his very own commentary on it. And this is actually what is happening ever since. So ever since there, there was his permission to just write own commentaries on the sutra without looking at the commentarial tradition and a commentarial tradition is um, just the, the basic thing, how sutras are read, how sutras are understood in the Indian tradition. So when I was in Bangalore to uh, one month, um, oh, I studied the Sankhya Karika one month with um, pandits there, but um, with the same pandits, I studied the Yoga Sutra. They had five commentaries at hand <laughs> and they just read them 
uh, one sutra and then one commentary, the next commentary, the next commentary. And then a sutra could not be read without that. But these were pendants that mean this is the intellectual, um, it, um, let's say, commentarial way of or using commentaries way of dealing with these very short sutras. Yeah. So this is a very new, let's say, new hundred 30, 120 years old way of dealing with the sutra, which is totally common today, and which is one of the aspects that I um, en enlist in my book um, of contemporary yoga philosophy, as I call it. And that's really what I'd like to get into detail talking about, you know, what, what is this contemporary yoga philosophy and, you know, what might it consist of if it wasn't trying all the time to justify itself in relation to the Yoga Sutra. But before we go there, I'd just like to look a little bit more at some of the misuses, perhaps. And um, one clear example that always arises for me, it's probably the first thing that jumps into my mind. Everybody wants to talk about eight limbs. They start with Yama and Niyama. You get to the fourth Yama. So it, people are generally happy to say, yeah, no harming, no problem. Uh, telling the truth, fine, don't steal. And then what's this Brahmacharya thing? Um, and you look at the commentary and it says restraint of the sexual organs. <laughs> it's just absolutely clear, no sex. And yeah, nobody today really is interested in that. So they try to make it mean something else. But instead of them saying, this is what the text says and this is what I want to do instead that's completely different, so I'm going to do that, they make the text say that <laughs> and translate it that way. So I wonder if you could say what would be a more responsible way perhaps of engaging with some of these differences. Yeah, well, I mean, in um, my research field, uh, which consisted of interviewing some senior teachers of Ashtanga Yoga um, and then also interviewing students, German students here um, in uh, the Ashtanga Yoga circle that I did a teacher training in and did my empirical research. Um, they dealt with it very differently and some actually dealt with it in a responsible way, I would say. I mean, it would just be r really looking, just searching for teachers that know Sanskrit and know the text and trying to engage with what the text and its commentaries there's not only the Pasha, there are also other younger commentaries that are authoritative. Um, and looking at what, like really looking at the, the big framework of the Sutra in its traditional context is. And um, then this playing, like presenting these contexts to students, telling them this is as far as we know right now with all the texts we still have, what do we know which texts don't exist anymore, for example, but with all we have, yeah, and um, and then maybe step away from that and say, I have out of my own experience or out of um, my own reflections, another way of looking at, for example, Brahmacharya or all other um, contents of the Yoga Sutra. But I think it would, there would really be a need to look at the basics of the text honestly and um, um, not only honestly, but respectful, yeah. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, there is a lot of concern these days about questions of cultural appropriation, but of course, you know, that, that, that would then require everybody to, 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 to engage, as you say, with this degree of honesty, that might mean that they would think, well, there's actually no way I want to implement what's in this text. So should yeah. teacher trainings just throw the Yoga Sutra away or is it, is it still possible to make use of it respectfully? Well, as I just said, I think um, there is complete possibility of make use of it respectfully. Or, um, so it, I would be but, also... But what would that look like, though, if, 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 if you don't want to implement exactly what it says? That's... If you don't want to implement exactly what it says? Yeah, yeah, if you don't wish to just detach from the world and sit still and yeah. never do anything ever again. Well, I think we should dare. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, you you taught in teacher trainings, did you? <laughs> well, I, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, also, what, what, no, what? no, I'm not saying anything. It would be interesting what you said, but what I want to say, I, I taught in teacher trainings too. And um, I think one ha if one teaches in teacher trainings and knows about these aspects of the Sutra, or of the um, Patanjali Yoga Shastra, um, one has to dare to name them and to present them and um, then to yep to have this I call it intellectual honesty to to 
to name this. So, and then the question is, I mean, I often taught this and people got angry. Yeah, that's <laughs> so what I was thinking. So. <laughs> so, but we have to deal with this then. And um, so if you, if you um, deal with this honestly, you might face reactions and then you have to deal with these reactions. And then you might also have to tell people, well, um, it, it also may be enriching to dive into another worldview that is 2000 years old. These people were totally different people that not totally, surely, but different people than we were. We are. They had very different contexts to live in. Um, they surely had a completely different mindset. And I am, um, I guess, another way of being in their bodies. We cannot imagine that. So and just to kind of open up the minds for another reality and not just put your own reality on something else but it can be very enriching to look at something else that you might not understand yet this is something and i think if one um if one opens this space of look this is something that can be enriching to look at another culture to look at another time another mindset another way of viewing the world and this might you might ask questions then you might um maybe ask questions about your own mindset about yeah and so i think this is something that that might be very enriching even if it might not rationalize what you do on your yoga mat <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I mean, just to illustrate, I suppose one thing I often find myself asking people is, you know, put up your hand if you came to yoga for the first time to avoid being reborn. And obviously, nobody puts their hand up. But that's that's what yoga was developed for. That 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 process of transcending this 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 cycle, um, and uh, therefore, I guess you know, <laughs> it leads us to then question: if we're not doing that, what is our objective? Uh, what is it that modern practitioners are seeking to do and how are they seeking to do it? And so we then have to ask our own questions about what our philosophy is rather than expecting to get it all straight from one text. So I think I think you're right. It can be a springboard for good discussions. So, yeah, um, minor technical glitch, but uh, we're, we're back again. <laughs> and uh, we were just talking about this uh, question that starts to arise if we're intellectually honest and we start to see that texts from 2000 years ago maybe aren't talking about life in the 21st century that we have to ask ourselves questions what are we doing why are we doing it uh, how should we do it um, which means you know we're thinking for ourselves and we're actually doing philosophy <laughs> rather than expecting it to just be rote learning dogma <laughs> it's asking questions and trying to find our own answers um, so i wonder in a way you were talking about this this relation to the mat if you could describe a little bit how you in 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 your book uh, talked about the connection between these three separate things really that are closely related um, yoga practice yoga philosophy and then day-to-day -day life um, and how they sort of influence each other if one is thinking openly about these connections rather than just ex assuming they're all the same thing and they come from Patanjali yes yeah I mean there was an observation that I just made doing my research, I just actually did not know when I came to um, the Ashtanga yoga field, I just entered the field with my research question, how is the yoga sutra taught? Why? What is the, um, where does it come from? <laughs> and um, I just realized how much it was interacting and actively connected to daily life experiences of the practitioners and so i yeah i, I just um saw it i mean as a as a empirical researcher you, as an ethnographer you have to be open-minded and just look at what you see you know and um try to interpret it then after you really observed it well and uh, ask questions about it and um so they, they, there are um, direct connections between yoga, contemporary yoga philosophy or philosophical contents stemming from that old Indian text, the Yoga Sutra, even if they may be reinterpreted and the physical practice and the experiences on the mat and daily life of the practitioners. Um, they are um, somehow um, these connections are made actively by the teacher, but they also happen. And I think if we come back to um, the 
let's say the imagination of an old yoga practitioner sitting somewhere meditating, not moving, one would also assume that this not moving has an influence on how the mind works. It, it has an influence on how, let's say, the thoughts work if the body does not engage with anything. So there is a correlation. Even in this very still body and the mind, there is a correlation. And one might guess that this was maybe a goal to calm the body and then also calm the mind so that it's easier <laughs> for the mind to calm down. But if we, we don't have that today, we just don't. We live our lives, we engage, we have children, we go to work, we um, are on social media. <laughs> so we have all of this, um, like a very full life, full of experiences that change us. And um, I think it's, it's just, if we if we don't think that body and mind are separate, but that they interact with each other always, then what we do in our daily life has to affect philosophical views or has to affect how we understand a text or yeah so um i think first of all like noticing and acknowledging this is, is already a certain honesty so um realizing that this happens and it might have to happen is one thing and then yeah so how does it concretely happen in my field um or in my research what did happen in my research field um yeah, for example, um, the Ashtanga yoga practice evokes flow experiences. So flow experiences, um, according to the one, uh, the psychologist who termed these experiences flow, Mihaly Chikchen Mihaly, um, are states of mind where you don't like feel yourself much anymore, but you are really, let's say, uh, totally mingling with the event you're in, might it be writing or might it be an Ashtanga yoga practice. And these flow experiences, as I worked out, for example, shape modern understandings of Samadhi. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, the way you describe that is almost identical to the sutras on Samapati, you know, the complete sort of merging with the object. But uh... That's true. That's completely true. But the sutra does not talk about it, doing it in an embodied practice. So, <laughs> no. but, I mean, it is interesting. It's almost, as you said earlier, the fruit of sitting still. Uh, it yeah. wouldn't be possible for that to arise otherwise. Yeah, and I think the question, I mean, I thought about that often because of course when you look at how flow states are described and when you also experience them i mean we all know flow states hopefully we all know flow states <laughs> because they're very pleasant <laughs> um and they're not only pleasant but you are very productive and this is one thing about flow states that might also differentiate it from the yoga sutras goal so you produce a lot prakriti <laughs> so um you <laughs> you really have an intense outcome when you are in a flow state you write a lot or you um, move a lot whatever so you are very focused but it's productive so and um yeah i think i think i thought about that a lot could one just say well it sounds so similar um this embodied flow state um to a samadhi or samapati as you said um that the sutra is describing this total merging with the object um but i think the context is missing then the context that the sutra is setting is missing and when i think one can compare it totally and one can maybe say i mean um the pashya is talking about simple samadhis it talks about samadhis that are daily life samadhis they are interrupted they are not constant they are not yeah so these samadhis exist but then maybe one should not call it a the samadhi that the yoga sutra is talking about yeah so or as they say in you know facebook groups i practice all eight limbs um yes. okay. <laughs> so, what well, do you do to do that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. And so this is how the practice just to make the point this is for example there are many other examples about how the yoga practice the ashtanga yoga practice influences how yoga philosophy is understood this is one of like i think a very uh, an example that can be um, built out very clearly and um, is kind of a bigger pick bigger um um thing I observed, and there are many very individual and small ways of having practice experiences and then interpreting the sutra. Yeah. 
Would it then maybe be more helpful or at least more honest um, to stop trying to relate it back to the sutra and just talk mm -hmm. about what's happening in practice and how we make sense of it and how that relates to our life objectives? It, what might that look like if people were to do that? Yeah, coming back to the question of the Yoga Sutra should be taught and teach it. <laughs> well, not necessarily. It's more just, is it the most helpful framework? Um, do we yeah. need a different one if our aim is to be in social interactions, in relationships, using practice as a way to steady ourselves enough to be a little bit more mindful in day to day life? And obviously, yeah. you talked quite a lot about the influence of mindfulness on the reality of how people interpret yoga practice and its meaning. But uh, I wonder what, 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 would, what would it look like to describe this flow Ashtanga practice if people stop trying to make it mean Samadhi? Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, like one thing is that and i maybe this is another little elephant in the room or a little elephant in the room i think we we, are, we as westerners if we want to call it like that we we have that wish for um exoticizing um mm. things we do yoga is just one example for that and it makes it more let's say true or maybe it makes it more um, one deals with it a bit more severe if it is old or if it has a, a sanskrit term <laughs> and so on so and i think when there are many people who have a really true interest in that and there's no disregard of that at all and i'm um, the only thing is maybe just using terms of the sutra or using the sutra without really looking at the context and without really looking at the bigger framework to then somehow exotify one's own practice experiences, I think it's getting more and more problematic. And um, one should be really careful about that. Cultural appropriation um, is a big um, issue. And um, so this is just one thought on that. We can talk about that further. The other thing is, I think, like I try to work out in the end of my book, what, what, how does the um, use of yoga philosophy, especially of the Yoga Sutra, how does this change yoga practice? And it does, according to my research, it does. So there's, for example, a search for a concentrative state. If we just do, for example, I don't want to say gymnastics because everybody bashes gymnastics and <laughs> calisthenics then <laughs> just a bit of stretching a bit of mindful movement <laughs> yeah if one would if one just moves for example it might not have the goal of concentration but if the yoga sutra comes in very often even if it's reinterpreted the practice might have the focus of i want to do it very very focused i just really want to avoid every distraction so the, just having the sutra, let's say, as a as a framework in the back, it changes the practice, not only towards concentration, but um, it yeah it changes the practice. It also changes daily life. Like I, I in interviews with students who don't know Sanskrit and who don't know um, like the sutra in its old traditional context, but they ask themselves questions about their chitta about their mind and um, they reflected on that in new ways and i think this is can be very helpful it can be something very different to other movement systems too and because it kind of opens a framework that is broader than the movement or then building up muscles and so on but i, I think and this is my view modern postural yoga, if we want to call it like that, in connection with contemporary yoga philosophy. And I think this connection got very close in the last 10, 15 years, much closer than it was before, is a new system that has its own right. And it is different from other movement systems. Yeah. So it, yeah, so yoga philosophy has somehow a meaning. It's, as you say, it's very connected to the kind of practice that's being done. Obviously, somebody who interprets yoga to mean, you know, basically 
devotional chanting <laughs> to become connected to a deity uh, or performing some other sort of ritual that is different to moving your body around on a yoga mat is not necessarily going to you know, frame their experience in the same way. However, though, this, this ingredient of concentration, mm -hmm. isn't that integral to yoga? Uh, without concentration, can it be yoga? Yeah, no, I don't think so. So concentration is a uh, extremely old and um, let's say common topic in different mm -hmm. yoga um, or understandings of yoga. Yeah. So if we were to then teach something today without any concentration, would the, would that not be even further from <laughs> anything that was traditionally yoga? So the concentration does seem to be quite an important continuity. And, uh, yeah, that's what I try to say. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Maybe I misunderstood the, the way you were describing it. I thought you were almost suggesting that uh, there, there was an attempt to make it mean that that that, that wasn't really rational. Oh. No. Oh, okay. That's yeah. I think that's so. That's a positive impact in a way of yes. looking at the yoga sutra. It's trying to understand why is something yoga and not just gymnastics. I see that's yes. what you were saying. Yeah. I would agree entirely. And I think I think in the end we have to come back down to a few core principles like that and say you know what wouldn't be yoga so that we can understand you know if we're going to call it yoga then some of these things probably need to be there but traditionally the main thing that needs to be there is transcendence of the cycle of birth <laughs> so if we take that out of the way then it's all a bit different but uh, perhaps there's a different way of talking about that we could see it within one lifetime the transcendence of you know unhelpful patterns uh, which is basically what the psychological analysis in the yoga sutra is talking about uh, yes so there's, there's lots of good tools in it but we have to admit that we're we're going to maybe use them for different purposes so i think that's the point that you're just making and this admitting that we maybe use them for different purposes yeah would we then be better off writing our own texts should <laughs> everybody write their own yoga sutra or yoga philosophy document <laughs> Who? Yeah, it's a difficult question. I, my first reaction would be no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, like for example, the way that I went of studying Indology, looking at the text, studying religious studies, um, then going via reception history of the text to modern ethnography not everybody can do that <laughs> it takes yeah, lots yeah. of time but if you i think if you want to talk about yoga philosophy and you want to somehow rewrite it and call it like that you should know all of this yeah no it's a long study process isn't it i mean the same way that you don't really learn how to teach people in you know, a few months of training you learn over years of practice and uh, yeah. apprenticeship the same with 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 yoga philosophy you're not going to read a book and just get it all in one go it's <laughs> going yeah. over the same material again and again and seeing you know the reality of, of of what it is that you're trying to do with it as well and that that's the real philosophy rather than just you know, parroting somebody else's opinion <laughs> yeah but then I, I guess why not write our own why, why, why shouldn't we in teacher trainings for example encourage students to to to, to say well why what are you doing why are you doing it and, and how do you think you should explain that to the people you teach oh. without quoting Patanjali <laughs> yes but on this I totally agree um this is somehow I mean I'm a yoga teacher too since hmm. 20 am I lying <laughs> since 16 years <laughs> okay. and um like not in a very broad framework I am not attracting um like thousands of people or something. I just like working with humans, let's say. Mm -hmm. And um, I always try to ask them, like, why are you doing this practice? What is your own motivation? And the thing is then that um, I, if someone just has his, her motivation um, clearly, and it totally differs, differs from what a yoga text says, I think it's completely okay if that person is clear on that and then maybe as a teacher one should say but then you're not doing Patanjali yoga <laughs> you know that so this is maybe the point um I think what happened in the yoga um, community over the last 20 years of or longer 
um, process of globalization, of um, having insurances, um, funding yoga courses for relaxation in Germany, you can you can only be you can only get the money back um, uh, for yoga as relaxation, not as movement practice, interestingly. So yoga is put in very different frameworks and we have this. Yeah. That's interesting. In the UK context, we don't really have that. You can't get state funded yoga. But what they did do in the 1960s, which had quite a big influence, I think, on how yoga is taught here, was say that BKS Iyengar could be funded with government money to teach teacher training courses, so long as they were only about fitness and not about <laughs> yes, philosophy and religion. <laughs> so, yeah. so similar things, yeah, just different contexts, different countries. Yeah. Yeah, so we have all these um, entanglements of modern life and modern structures that come into yoga and so um, that attract a broad uh, amount of students and they will not all strive for uh, transcending a circle of rebirth. So um, how do we deal with this? It's a question that actually um, I think is is not addressed um, enough, especially not in Germany. I don't know if it's addressed enough in the English speaking yoga community, which is always a bit, let's say, in my view, a bit more keen on discussing, but maybe not. To be honest, about the, the most uh, enriching yoga conversations I've had in recent times were, were with uh, Norwegians, for the most part. I just went to a festival in Norway this summer, and uh, although everybody was speaking a second language, they were, they were really switched on, and they were very, most of them, I think, were Ashtanga practitioners, but they were, mm -hmm. they were very open-minded, and uh, I say most, I mean, that was certainly the background for the, for, 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 for the setting, and yeah, they just wanted to talk about ideas, and that's actually mm -hmm. not something I usually encounter in the yoga mm -hmm. world. Um, mm -hmm. Even on the teacher training, you know, some of the students are interested. Uh, some of them just want to learn how to teach postures and, and do their own practice. So ideas, are, and, uh, you know, they're still not so popular. And yet it's not new to be saying what we're discussing here. I mean, Carl mm -hmm. Jung, I think, was very sure mm -hmm. that Westerners needed their own yoga philosophy. Mm -hmm. Georg Feuerstein also had the same idea. Um, mm -hmm. So people have been raising it, but it just seems it comes up and then it disappears again. <laughs> it's not yeah. so, people, people, as you say, are attached to the old and the idea that, you know, what we're doing goes back a long time and that that validates it. And this quest to be authentic um, mm -hmm. hasn't often translated into being, you know, honest about our own relationship with things, yeah, authentic to one's own objectives rather than pretending that they're the same as the old ones. Yeah, on the one hand, I mean, I totally agree. The thing is, if the term yoga is in there, one has to deal with yoga. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point. If we if if we're going to be really, you know, kind of the yoga police here and go around <laughs> telling people, you know, to think carefully about this, um, should some things then that are called yoga today not actually be called yoga? And if so, what is it about them that isn't yoga? What are they instead? Mm hmm. Well, Anya Foxen raised a question in her book. I guess you read it, and um, the Inhaling Spirit book, the one about yeah, building on Mark Singleton's uh, stuff about uh, the influence of women's gymnastic systems on on many Indian yoga teachers long before Western yoga practitioners. Yeah. Yes, and she talks about like non-lineage contexts. Let's say the normal um, yoga flow let's say just um, vinyasa flow lessons in a fitness studio or also in a yoga um, studio but they are called yoga or vinyasa it's a sanskrit term it comes from the yoga tradition um or yeah or sort of <laughs> oh no it's not that old as we might think but um it is surely used by krishnamacharya and Patavi joyce yes. Yes. <laughs> and um, so if we should call um, these non lineage contexts, and I would, um, I, I would say also some of the lineage contexts is still refer to a lineage, but do something very different today. Should we not call them, it, it would be I think she uses the term intellectual honesty, that's where I have it from, would it not be more intellectually honest to not call it yoga. And I, I do uh, agree on that. Um, how should we call it then? I mean, um, as we um, had our exchange before, you said maybe Del Zatik or Del Zat. This was um, a very influential teacher in the late 19th century who had this 
big influence on um, what was called American desertism after his um, death, actually. Um, he, he, was, he was not building up a, a movement system, um, but he was just interested, he was teaching um, um, actors and singers um, how to move, how to express the inner to the outer. <laughs> and um, so from, from this Delzat, Francois Delzat lineage, um, should we maybe call uh, today's movement systems that are not striving for high concentrative states or that are not striving, which would be very yog yogic, as we just said, um, or are not searching for um, escaping the circle of rebirth and so on. Should we call it maybe desertic or desertism? How did you call it? Desert? Uh, well, you know, in your book, you use both desertic and desertism. So desertism would be the, the English version. Yeah. Yes. And yes. I mean, I think we should probably point out just that this is not some abstract idea that scholars have invented. Um, Delsart is probably you know, it's via um, students, uh, the source of ideas that inspire Pilates um, and also what's today called somatics. So, you know, pure embodiment practices is getting into your body and feeling it. Um, so it's, it's, it's very much about the integration of doing those things with the idea of mind, body and spirit all working together and the inner and the outer worlds connecting. So it's got a whole philosophical worldview that's actually very similar to what people think yoga philosophy is. <laughs> and actually yeah. they're getting their ideas from there, from Western places rather than from Indian ones, but then sourcing them to Indian texts because there's a, yes. a similarity. Yeah, I worked that out in I have a, this little historical part on um, the physical um, culture movement and really focusing then also on Del Zad, but also on some German um, important figures um, on that somehow were the basis of somatics today, like Elsa Gindler, for example. And um, when, yeah, like my why I integrated this in my book, which is on yoga philosophy, <laughs> was exactly <laughs> this. It was exactly this, that um, when I started my first teacher training in 2006, um, it was all about the connection of body, mind and soul. And then when I started to study Indology, I realized that this connection of body, mind and soul, it always misses the body and soul is something else than I thought. <laughs> so, well, and also for Patanjali, the body and the mind have to be separated from the is. soul. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So, so, yeah. so where in an Indian text is this equation of integrating the body into this, you know, um, into uh, this, we have to unify body, mind and soul. Where do I find that in an Indian or in the Yoga Sutra, for example? And um, right. Yeah. This is what came up in your book and also via Elizabeth de Michaelis, you know, you go to the back of Iyengar's Yoga Sutras and it's all about that union with God, union of body, mind and spirit and all about that, a huge yeah. influence. Yeah. 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 It's true. Iyengar was a very important figure for kind of um, getting the body in the equation. <laughs> but, oh, um, and he was uh, influenced by these um, circles too. these I would not say by desertism purely because there was another time, but it just went on. Um, after Delzat, of course, and also after the Second World War, which was kind of a break for these systems. And after the Second World War, yoga got very big and all these movement systems that were there in the, in the 1930s, still in Germany, I, I can only now talk about, or I do talk about Germany, they were just destroyed by the 1930s uh, interactions um, and yeah so we see that in desertism um, the this unifying to kind of integrate the the the, the body and the mind um, and have also and soul means very often emotions to have kind of this to be able to express with your body what you think and what you feel, to have this real embodiment. There is a philosophy behind that. We could call it a, wor a worldview. It's a view on how, what is a human being? How does it work? What does it need? So there, there yeah, is a view on how, how one can practice 
with what motivation and what is the outcome? The outcome would be a very balanced human being that is somehow in tune with its inner, let's say, um, yeah, emotions and thoughts. And maybe if this is what we search for in our yoga practice, we could call it somehow some somehow desertism. Yeah. It's certainly whether whether we give it that name or think of a new one that people might be happier to use. Um, it's got a lot more to do with what people are looking for. Um, they're looking for something life affirming usually from the yoga That's practice, it. and they're not looking to deny emotions. Um, although some who get very serious about you know the very self disciplined approach to to practice can almost control them out of existence and try to you know pretend that everything's all balanced, uh, but. For most of us, I think we're you know, really just trying trying to be a bit more at peace while not giving up being alive, <laughs> and uh, and so actually focusing on what's really happening and what we feel and feeling it rather than trying to make it all go away is is what it's all about. And there aren't many yoga texts that talk about that. That's not what traditional Indian yoga was interested in. The mind and the emotions are all tied up in the same process of activity that requires us to keep acting in the world and if we can get that under control we won't need to be active anymore we've switched off the machinery um so yeah yeah, it's, yeah. and i think that context matters oh did you want to add no uh, no no no, no. I, th I think you're right i sorry i don't want to cut you off there because i think context is everything it's it's it, that seems to be the key word yoga means so many different things in so many different contexts just in india over the centuries mm -hmm. but now here in the world it's it's in a new context 21st mm -hmm. century western world is different 21st yeah. century indian world is different mm -hmm. so okay. we, have, we have to make you know kind of our own assessment of what we're trying to do um mm -hmm. so i think you're right to emphasize context but please go ahead yeah and i think we i mean this is a very like important term that i use to analyze the data that i collected is decontextualization and it is a term that veronique altglas uses in um, her book, book from yoga to kabbalah um, yeah, she's quite scathing isn't she about <laughs> she makes it sound like nobody's really doing yoga and everybody's just doing this bricolage of whatever they think they're bricolage, doing. yeah this is a <laughs> um the um, levi strauss term that she uses too yeah but um decontextualization is um very relevant when looking at how these texts are used today so they are somehow um mm, as we said before it would be nice to put them in the context they have been produced in and then maybe differ from that context with new interpretations. There would be intellectual honest. For that, you need to know the context. For that, we have scientists that look at <laughs> what the context was, for example, the very meticulous work of Philip Maas. But um, so this is this is the, the, the context that is often like left out of old India, um, the context of the Yoga Sutra. But also I think we forget our context today very often. So we forget that um, we are in a very special and unique and unknown phase of being a human. <laughs> in digital age and um, what has happened is for example a, a deep disembodiment already by the mm. uh, societies we live in by the work we have to do and if now we put a disembodied philosophy on already disembodied humans it might not help it might help some but it might not help others and so i think if people have the context in their mind so why am i doing what i'm doing for what am i doing it what do i need do i already have a depression and am i totally disembodied which by when you have a depression often is the case you don't feel your body anymore and then you dive into patanjali's world that might not help you so it, your own own individual context and the context of our societies here, they matter. And so I think we should really talk about that and not just dogmatically teach something which might not be right in this time, in this context. It's a really good point. And I think even to go back to the context from which this text emerged, the Yoga Sutra, I mean, it's really a summary of a thousand years of previous yoga history, um, meditation practice, basically. Um, and it's therefore coming from the same place as, as what the Buddha had to say, uh, except the Buddha sort of found a, a slightly less ascetic way of talking about some of these ideas. 
Um, and it's probably for that reason that you know, we get some of the Buddhist philosophy, particularly around its secularized modern variant mindfulness, being used to make sense of yoga practice because it does speak a little bit more to an engagement with thoughts and feelings. The, the sutra, mm -hmm. the, sorry, the discourse by the Buddha about setting up mindfulness talks mm -hmm. about engagement with the body in its different postures while going about day-to-day -day activities so mindful mm -hmm. washing up is in there mm -hmm. almost um, and then at the same time also you know paying attention to the coming and going of thoughts and feelings it, it's mm -hmm. to understand that we're not any of those things is the ultimate mm -hmm. role but the, mm -hmm. like all of it there's degrees so mm -hmm. we can just engage in it enough to just become in the body enough to feel we have a body we can engage in it much further as the buddha would say and see through the illusion of you know <laughs> the conditioned existence um, and so people can still sit and meditate and achieve very high states of concentration and no one's trying to suggest that's impossible it's just that that's not what most people are doing probably not what most people want and if the text they're looking at is talking only about that then perhaps other texts or other you know interpretations might be more helpful so I wonder yeah you know, when you looked at mindfulness did you think this engagement with mindfulness was a, a sort of positive potentially constructive uh, combination bricolage or was it just another way of missing the point yeah it, it, it took a while i mean i just uh, it took a while to understand this um yeah just very intense influence that mindfulness has on yoga contemporary yoga philosophy is i mean in my field and i have to say that um this german ashtanga yoga field i mean i also interviewed um senior teachers from all over the world but um students and so on here in germany it, it was already let's say a reformed ashtanga yoga so in i don't know how much mindfulness really inspires um Charat Joyce Ashtanga Yoga, I cannot say that just to make that clear. And um, but I know that, of course, in other yoga um, styles, mindfulness is also a very big, um, a very big influence. And I, I did not. Yeah. I was going to say, whether it's acknowledged or not, I would I mean, you, yes. you talked, you quoted this great line from BKS Iyengar, which comes from his Yoga Sutra book, talking about, you know, the states of dhyana meditation. Um, and he says he gets people to meditate by shouting instructions at them so that they can't avoid feeling their bodies. <laughs> so they're mindful of the body because it's move this, do that, do the other. Stay in your headstand. Don't come down. Yeah. Feel the pain. <laughs> So yeah, uh, it's not talking about mindfulness, but that is mindfulness of the body. Yes, Sorry, you were going to totally. say that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, it, it, it somehow interweaves with the, let's say, um, development of modern yoga, I would say since the 1970s or longer. And um, it's it, it's not always clear that that's actually something that in in modern yoga history is very common influences that come from somewhere else than the yoga tradition are hidden. <laughs> they are not obvious. <laughs> you have to search for them. <laughs> Where does that come from? <laughs> um, it is somehow yeah a little. Um, how would you say a Schatzsuche when you look for for, uh, uh, for a treasure a hunt? Treasure hunt, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so um, it took me a while to understand um, how much mindfulness influenced this contemporary um, sort of contemporary yo phil uh, yoga philosophy that I ha dealt with. And um, for example, when I looked at Atta, um, the first word of uh, the Yoga Sutra, which actually um, is like translated as now and now means being very present and very aware and just being focused on the present moment in my field that's um how it was taught in the teacher training i joined while in this even turned into a mantra you were saying you know just to take the first two words atta yoga if, if you never understood any more than that you'd have understood everything you know? yeah yoga is now <laughs> be that's in the now yeah, and this is like pure, let's say, modern mindfulness, one has to, to call it modern mindfulness. And um, so, it, yeah, it, it took me a while. And there, there was a very, or is a very good book that came out in 2020 from Jakob Schmidt, unfortunately, is only in German. And it's called Kulturelle Achtsamkeit, Cultural Mindfulness, or um, yeah, the culture of mindfulness would be maybe um, 
a good translation, I guess. And he really differentiates um, uh, it out, um, different sorts of mindfulness. I wasn't aware that there are so many different sorts of mindfulness from John Kabat-Zinn, but also Thich Nhat Hanh. Of course, I knew that, but that they taught different ways of mindfulness. And that there is this one sort of mindfulness that I completely found in my field, which is um, aliveness in the body which is being um, like really celebrating actually being in the body. And I trace it then back to, because Jakob Schmidt traces it back to the beatnik generation of the 1950s and 60s, and from then to the 1970s, to the um, hippie flower power movement, and then to John Kabat-Zinn and others, and then to modern mindfulness. And they, they the beatniks already, they taught, um, your whole body is holy, your everything is holy, the whole world is holy. It's, it sounds a bit Indian, it sounds a bit monistic. It's and they were influenced, of course, by Indian thought at that Absolutely. time. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And but, then even this concept of vibrations, good vibrations. Yes. <laughs> Tuning in, raising your vibration. It's got this Western yeah. New Age spin as well. Yeah. So um yeah, and this kind of connection to mindfulness, I think it's much older than we think, and it influenced um, yoga much sooner than we think. Maybe even the first Ashtanga yogis uh, traveling to India were already influenced by the Beatnik generation, the former Beatnik generation. Well, Ram Das in his book was obviously very influential, titled Be Here Now, so it's... <laughs> Sure. And so I think somehow removing the mindfulness from uh, contemporary yoga philosophy would be difficult. I think it would be difficult. Um, and I'm not sure like how good this development is. Um, I think mindfulness has its um, complete, let's say, um, it is a good path for many. Um, but not for everybody, as always. And then calling it yoga philosophy, I think this sh should be, there has to be a, an exchange about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like everything, isn't it? We've got to sort of actually see what's going on and um, mm -hmm. perhaps, you know, almost to sum it up, uh, what we've identified through talking about this is that uh, yoga is, uh, to take your title, always in motion. Nothing is fixed. Definitions are changing, philosophical systems are getting combined with other ones in ancient India long before, you know, there were any texts even, and it's just got more and more, you know, involved and more and more globalized. The problem is that throughout that history, nobody admits it. <laughs> they always <laughs> pretend it's all timeless. So when Krishnamacharya is trying to say, oh, it all comes from the yoga Kurunta or, or I got this, uh, this dream when, where, where I channeled a long lost text from Natamuni, um, you know, he's, he's just trying to be traditional uh, while being innovative in a way that is respecting the, the Indian way of doing those things. And Westerners have almost taken that on board as well, that, you know, it has to be timeless or it's worthless. <laughs> so to say I've got some new ideas or even I've got a new posture um, isn't something that people want to do. So instead they invent a Sanskrit name for a new shape that they just you know, came up with five years ago and mm -hmm. uh, you know, try and make it sound like it goes back further. And mm -hmm. be, as you say, intellectually honest, I think if we could mm -hmm. acknowledge that we are changing things and mm -hmm. to just see how we actually want to do that um, and mm -hmm. to, to be clear about why we're doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess that leads me back to my, my my fundamental question is, you know, should we be writing our own philosophy or should we at least be having these kinds of conversations? Should this be on the timetable in a yoga studio? Let's talk yoga. Because um, it's not something I ever see. And that festival I went to in Norway was one of the few places I've been where talking was as much on the timetable as sitting, as pranayama, as asana practice. And it's very inspiring from that point of view. I'd like to see mm -hmm. more of that. Have you encountered that anywhere in Germany where philosophical discussions happen except in teacher trainings? In the yoga uh, surrounding, mm. except in, in teacher trainings. Just in the yoga, you mean in like a, at a studio. yoga studio? Do they have even book clubs or you know places where people might talk about ideas? Well, in, in no, <laughs> it's the same here. Say that first. No, um, but when I see, let's say, these discussions, it, it will always has to be framed by an old Indian text or by a medieval Indian text. It doesn't matter, and. Um, yeah, so this is happening, but um, I, 
I think maybe Germany might be very like might be at a very different um, point than Norwegian yoga <laughs> or Britain yoga. I don't, well, know. I don't know what it was about Norway. Maybe it was just you know, a good, good a good community that came together, and you know it's pulling together all the different people who wanted to talk. Uh, and they're certainly <laughs> out there because yeah, here we are having this conversation, and there are many forums now online where people talk about ideas. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned in your book uh, Seth Powell's yogic studies site. Um, I've also been running courses. Uh, other academics have been bringing their ideas to the public as well at you know a slightly higher level where they're really engaging in detailed analysis of things and people want to hear about it. Um, yes. So it, it, so as Centre for Yoga Studies, where you launched your book, yeah, 100 people turned up to hear about it. Yes. So I guess my final question would be is, you know, what sort of influence does, does scholarly work have on the world of practitioners? Because <laughs> sometimes it seems like they're two different worlds that are interested in each other, but almost not really in dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I would like to answer your question on <laughs> should we write our own? Oh, okay, if, please, yeah. If we still have the time, I don't know. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. I'm and happy then to I will answer the yeah. last question. Um, what I do think what um, would be very enriching, and I, I hoped to somehow give the German yoga community with my book a little, um, let's say, push towards discussion and exchange, yeah? um, I think it would be so valuable to have these conversations. It would be so valuable to talk about honestly without having, let's say, um, this big um, uh, your true old yoga philosophy above our heads. And we cannot say, for example, well, I'm just doing it for these reasons. Can I? <laughs> but you, you, you always. Are, but, but I have to have other reasons. It has to be deeper. It has to be something else. Um, if we can start to 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 get that honesty back and um, to really have chats about it, I think something new and um, can develop. As I said, we are not doing desertism. We are not doing just gymnastics, whatever that is. We are not just doing stretching. What we are, what is happening right now, also through globalization and uh, through chats that we have and social media and so on and all these um, forums that you just talked about, like so Center of Yoga Studies and so on, um, something is developing that is um, something new. It's not old Patanjali. And I think um, it needs to be addressed um, with much more activity. What is this? How can it look like? How can we talk about that? And so on. So this would be well, maybe not, maybe you don't have to write the book <laughs> um, immediately, but at some point, why not? And then with intellectual honesty and with, with respect towards the yoga tradition too, because it exists. And um, yeah, and then surely these conversations need to get uh, more and broader and more honest. And I suppose that's what I was kind of teasing towards in my comment about academia. I sometimes feel that, you know, scholars could, could, could actually make that more of a project um, rather than just informing the public of their research, which often comes across like hitting them around the head. Everything you think, you know, is wrong. Um, it could perhaps be trying to see, you know, with questions and an invitation towards dialogue. How can we together evolve an honest assessment of what we're doing? rather yeah. than, you know, we've got all the answers and you're all ignorant. <laughs> and I think you're doing a very good job in that, I have to say, because mm -hmm. I see you just often asking questions and trying to ask these questions together with your listeners or with your readers. And um, while I have this, it's just very small and I'm just doing it at the side, my yoga nerds, the Instagram profiles, it's just to have some exchange to get give some informations yes because i, I have them I, I put five years in in finding out <laughs> things so um i have some um, knowledge that others don't so i want to share that but i don't want to give like fixed answers that are the truth because i'm a scientist i'm a, I'm a doctor um but um so i'm i'm searching for these discussions and um so i think this yeah needs to surely uh, get more and become more and uh, i see with your work and um also many other people working towards that that it happens and i think it's really necessary yeah 
I guess my sort of invitation to anyone who's still with us at this point is uh, get us all together in a room and we can have a really yes. good chat because it's too much of it's happening electronically and it'd be nice to, to make it a bit more Completely. organic. <laughs> yeah, it is so much fun uh, to chat about that and so important. Yeah. Cool. Well, in the spirit of yoga nerdery, thank you very much. It's been a great chat. <laughs> thank <Lara>. you, <laughs> But invitation was great. Oh, and thank you for your book as well. <laughs>